Getting out of a falling aircraft has been a challenge for aviators since the dawn of air combat. Initially, the tried and true method of escape was to dive out of a stricken aircraft. Such a task became increasingly difficult as aircraft speeds and service ceilings increased. Since the 1940s, a life-saving device has saved thousands of pilots. Today, we're taking a look into the history of the ejection seat. Real fast, I do want to plug a project I'm helping with. My friend Brandon F. is currently working on a novel titled The Corpse War of 1793. This is a period piece set in a fictional zombie outbreak in 18th century England, and it's definitely looking awesome. My side of the project is to produce artwork for the novel, and if you go to the link in the description below, you can support the project on Kickstarter. By pledging via the link, I get an affiliate cut which helps me out, the support for the project helps Brandon out, and you can come away knowing you're helping fuel what is sure to be an awesome book. That being said, let's get back to the ejection seats. The idea of a powered ejection seat came during the Great War, where experimentation with primitive parachute technology highlighted the problem of the pilot actually getting out of the plane. While parachutes weren't adopted en masse by pilots as of 1916, the idea of preserving the pilot's life was already being experimented with. I did a video covering early parachute development, but one of the big problems with egressing a plane was the pilot impacting parts of the aircraft or the parachute being caught up in the tumbling crate itself. Early aircraft barely pushed past 100 miles an hour, but even then, if you had one of the rare parachutes of the day, it would still be akin to trying to climb out of a car window on the freeway. And please don't do that, by the way. The combination of wind blasts and g-forces were the main issues, and aircraft designer Everard Calthrop envisioned a concept of a seat that would effortlessly blast the pilot clear of their plane. A 1916 patent depicted a device that would eject the parachute via compressed air. The force of the deploying parachute would then pull the pilot free. Over a decade later, Anastase Dragomir, a Romanian inventor, created what he called a catapulted cabin. The device was designed to eject the pilot, his seat, and a parachute in one contained catapult system. Dragomir's device was first successfully tested on August 25, 1929, when it was fired from a Maurice Farman biplane over Paris. The ejection seat concept would remain a novelty going into the Second World War. As fighter planes flew faster and higher, however, the impetus of an ejection seat grew. British testing in the 1940s showed that conventional bailouts were almost impossible over 200 miles per hour, as the pilot could do little to even move against the torrential wind blast. During the course of the war, the Germans experimented with compressed air ejection seats. The first practical ejection seats were fitted to the Heinkel HE-280, an early jet design preceding the infamous ME-262. In January 1944, German test pilot Helmut Schenk became the first person to escape from an aircraft crash with an ejection seat when he lost control of his HE-280 on an unpowered glide flight. As the war drew to a close and jet technology began to take center stage, ejection seats became a necessity. Forget a 200 mile per hour wind blast, planes were quickly passing through 500 miles per hour. The British Ministry of Defense approached the Martin Baker Company in 1944 to research ejection seats to be applied to the new jet aircraft fielded by the RAF. The Martin Baker Company was formed in 1934 by Sir James Martin and Captain Valentine Baker to design aircraft, but the company suffered a massive loss in 1942 when their lone MB3 prototype crashed, killing Valentine. No longer aiming to build airplanes, James Martin pursued pilot escape systems, fueled by the loss of his friend and business partner. Martin devised a seat fired not by compressed air, but with an explosive charge that would allow the pilot to clear the stricken aircraft's tail. The first Martin Baker seat, the Mark I, was fitted to a Gloucester Meteor on January 20, 1945, and successfully fired a dummy clear of the plane. Four months later, on July 24, 1945, Bernard Lynch repeated the stunt, using his own body as the test subject. The Mark I in the rear cockpit of the Meteor fired safely at 8,000 feet, and Lynch deployed his parachute without incident. Just to ensure his safe ejection wasn't a fluke, he would repeat the process 30 more times the Martin Baker seat was a viable escape system. Many British aircraft were soon fitted with the new tool, and in 1949, the ejection seat saved its first life. Pilot Jean Lancaster was a test pilot for the new Armstrong Whitworth AW-52, when he experienced severe pitch oscillations in flight. Putting his life in Martin Baker's hands, he gripped the ring pull above his head and was blown clear of the departed aircraft. 
The first real-world emergency in which a Martin Baker seat was needed resulted in Lancaster safely descending in his parachute after unbuckling himself from the fired seat. Over the years, and with various improvements, the Martin Baker seats proliferated across the world, being fitted to countless Western aircraft. The Cold War era saw rapid advancements in ejection seat technology, spurred by the development of supersonic interceptors. Hitting supersonic wind blasts after ejection could subject pilots to over 40 Gs as experienced by F-100 pilot George Franklin Smith. Smith was flying off Laguna Beach, California at 35,000 feet when his controls locked up. As it slipped past Mach 1, the Hun experienced Mach Tuck, a normal phenomenon involving the nose dipping. Now in an uncontrolled dive and his controls unresponsive, Smith elected to eject at Mach 1.05. The seat successfully fired, but the violent wind blast immediately began to slow his unaerodynamic body down. Hemorrhages turned the whites of his eyes beet red, and his intestines were lodged against his pelvis. Almost immediately, he lost consciousness. Luckily, ejection seat technology included the advent of automatically deploying parachutes by this point. As it unfurled, the high speed ripped almost a third of the canopy away. The limp, lifeless body of George Smith would have been lost to the sea if it hadn't been for a stroke of luck. A small fishing boat, the Balabas. The crew of the Balabas spotted the parachute and immediately sailed to the pilot to rescue him. He was then transferred to a Coast Guard vessel for treatment. Despite the horrific event, George Smith had become the first survivor of a supersonic ejection. A new, terrifying environment in the world of aviation. To counter the dangers of high-speed ejection, the U.S. Air Force developed specialized escape capsules for their upcoming supersonic bombers like the B-58 Hustler and XB-70 Valkyrie. The F-111 Aardvark was also equipped with an escape capsule for its two crewmen sitting side by side. In the event of an emergency, the capsule would separate via rockets and deploy parachutes for the crew inside. Airbags would also deploy to cushion the landing. If the ejection was over water, the cockpit section was even buoyant enough to float as a makeshift lifeboat. It was a remarkable system, but capsule escape systems have since been replaced in favor of improved seats and crew equipment better designed to handle high-speed ejections. Capsules were heavy, expensive, and less effective at lower altitude, which brings me to the other end of the spectrum. Low and slow-speed ejections had often been a surefire way to get killed in an emergency. Early seats launching with explosive catapults didn't really have the smash to throw a pilot high enough from a static or slow aircraft at low altitude. This became a severe problem for early Navy jets, which were required to fly on the knife's edge of their underpowered engines when coming back in for landing on a pitching deck. If a Navy plane were to go into the drink, it was extremely difficult to get out of the rapidly sinking aircraft. At first, ejecting underwater was thought unthinkable and sounds like an absolute nightmare scenario if you ask me. And believe it or not, it's happened. Royal Navy aviator Bruce McFarlane was one of the few pilots to eject underwater and live to tell the tale. McFarlane was the pilot of a Westland Wyvern, a propeller-driven aircraft equipped with an ejection seat. The Wyvern was a decent aircraft, but had a flaw in its Armstrong Sidley Python engine. When launched from a catapult, the high G-forces involved in the cat stroke often caused fuel starvation and stopped the engine. The unpowered Wyverns found themselves going right off the deck into the water. That's exactly what McFarlane experienced on October 13, 1954 when he launched from HMS Albion. After landing in the water, he was unable to exit the craft before the Albion's hull severed the wyvern in two and drove it underwater. As his craft sank deeper, McFarlane pulled the ejection handle on his Martin Baker Mark I and was fired out under Albion's hull. He barely untangled himself from the web of his parachute lines as the carrier passed above him, and he was able to clamber to the surface. The feat was surprising to the Martin Baker team, who never expected their seat would work in such conditions. By the late 1950s, training films were created by the U.S. Navy to instruct pilots to actually wait to eject until they were fully submerged. If they were to eject on the surface, there wouldn't be enough time for the parachute to deploy before hitting the concrete like water. Once again, Martin Baker came through with a solution. Instead of just increasing the size of the single explosive charge which would cause severe spinal injuries, Martin Baker began fitting multiple charges in a sequence in their Mark V seat, which was designed specifically for naval aircraft. The Mark V saw use in aircraft like the A6 Intruder, F-11 Tiger, and the F-8 Crusader. The seat could deliver an aviator under parachute as long as the aircraft was moving at at least 60 miles an hour, even at ground level. A true 0-0 capability seat was always desired though, an ejection seat which would work with no speed and no altitude, as if the aircraft were still sitting on the ramp. 
Probably the most iconic Martin Baker ejection seat was developed with a rocket-assisted ejection package in the 1960s, the Mark 7. The Mark 7 was Martin Baker's first true zero-zero seat. It was fitted en masse to Germany's F-104G fleet to cut down on pilot fatalities that often occurred at low speed during low-altitude attacks. Fitted to newer generation aircraft like the F-4 Phantom, F-14 Tomcat, and even the EA-6B Prowler, the Mark 7 has saved over 1,900 aircrew from various accidents. The Mark 7 is still in use in active Phantoms around the world like the Turkish Air Force's Terminator 2020 variant, which is expected to stick around until at least 2030. Those who have ejected from a Martin Baker seat are inducted into a special club known as the Thai Club. Since the 1950s, the Martin Baker Company has presented a special certificate and necktie to those who have bailed out in one of the company's seats. It's a tradition that has persisted for almost 70 years and continues today with over 7,000 Thai Club members and thus, over 7,000 lives saved by the eponymous ejection seats. Until now we focus primarily on western seats, but I think it's worth touching on the other side of the Iron Curtain. The Soviet Union developed ejection seats of their own. The first seat-equipped Soviet aircraft was the MiG-15, which featured the KK-1. The KK-1 ejection seat, from what I could find, was pretty similar in capabilities to the Mark I and the North American F-86 seat. As a first-generation ejection seat, it merely fired an explosive charge to catapult the pilot and parachute out of the aircraft. Once in a freefall, it was the pilot's responsibility to free himself from the seat and pull his parachute. The MiG-17 and early MiG-21s used a canopy capsule seat, which involved the canopy hinging off its mount and connecting to the seat itself to create a sort of high-speed ejection capsule. These were clearly far from the Zero-Zero seats that would come later, and one of the most common Soviet ejection seats of the day, the KM-1, was notorious for causing severe back injuries. Back injuries were and still are common during violent ejections. However, there's something to be said about the KM-1 when Soviet pilots would apparently tend to try and crash land their MiGs rather than attempt an ejection. The Soviets would eventually get their own Zero-Zero seat in the form of the KYA-1M ejection seat. This notable Soviet ejection system was within the Yak-38 Forger. Being a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, the Forger required a zero-zero ejection seat since it was expected to stop in mid-air for takeoff and landing. The system was unique in that it was designed to automatically fire the pilot out if the Forger rotated 60 degrees or more when in hover mode. Another notable system is the Zvezda K-36 series, used primarily on their fourth-generation fighters like the MiG-29 and Su-27. The Zero Zero label was proven in 1975 when a Su-24 navigator of the 63rd Bomber Regiment accidentally punched himself out on the ground. Which makes it the first successful Zero Zero ejection ever outside of testing. Now I've said it before and I'll say it again, check out Paper Skies for this one. Overall, the K-36 is a well-made seat, comparing well to the American Aces II seat, which is used in planes like the F-15, 16, and 22. In a 1996 DTIC report comparing the K-36D with the Aces II, the K-36D performed remarkably well. According to the report, the K-36 ejection seat accelerations at 729 knots were similar to those measured on the Aces II and Naces seats at about 450 knots. A big concern regarding the K-36, however, were high G-loads applied to the head and neck during canopy opening, and the positioning of leg restraints resulted for the potential in extreme lower leg torsion upon sea firing. Ouch. The study also found that the time required to develop a fully inflated parachute is longer for the K-36 than the Aces II. It's definitely worth reading the study, which will be in the links below. It's an interesting comparison between the two different philosophies in ejection seat design. Modern ejection seats incorporate cutting-edge materials, advanced computer systems, and enhances the life support features. The latest designs, such as the Martin Baker Mark 16 and the Aces 5, utilize sensors that assess the pilot's position and automatically adjust the ejection sequence for optimal survival. These seats can accommodate a wider range of body types and ensure safer ejections even in extreme flight conditions. Just this past month, an F-35A pilot bailed out over Eielson Air Force Base and his Martin Baker US-16E after suffering an undisclosed problem. The investigation is still ongoing as of this video's release, but give it a year or two. From the early compressed air designs of the 1940s to the sophisticated rocket seats of today, ejection technology continues to evolve in response to the demands of modern combat. As aircraft continue to push the envelope, Innovations in seat technology will remain a vital aspect of pilot survival and aviation engineering. 
Thanks for watching, guys, and as always, I want to give a special shout out to my patrons, especially my Ace of Aces tier. Uh, special shout outs go to Captain Fantastic, Shuck45, Deuce, Ghoul, Iron, Jake Fuentes, Kodai, Peck Ops, Private Petey, Aspen, Tico, Weefy, Boats FG, and Blake. Keep that sun at your back now, gang. Have a good one.